Hey everybody, it's Charles from HumbleMechanic.com. Today, taking your questions on. The speedometer's not working. Buying an A8, taking over a shop and more. This is episode 255 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. All right, if you want to get a question on a show like this, email me, charles at HumbleMechanic.com, and be sure to put question for Charles in that subject line. That's the filter I use to filter through your emails. Also, if listening is more your thing, you can get the audio-only version of these and many other videos on iTunes, Stitcher, Google, or of course, as always, over at HumbleMechanic.com. All right, let's talk about the sponsor of the day, which is CRP Automotive. CRP deals in a ton of OE maintenance and repair parts, timing belt kits, suspension components, and even fluids. In fact, they make the factory DSG fluid for Volkswagen and Audi. So check them out at crpautomotive.com. And real quick, if you want to support the show and score discounts to places like Black Forest, Eastwood, MT Knives, Sonic Tools, Kerma TDI, Scanner Danner, USP Motorsports, Adams Polishes, Prime Shades, and a whole bunch more, check out that crew membership program. As always, links to that and everything we're going to talk about today are down in the description. All right, that's wrapped up. Let's hit the questions. First one up, hey, I have a question about a Mark III Cabrio. Bought the car with 99,000 miles on it. Everything in the gauge cluster was working, plus the cruise control. To have a Mark III with cruise control working is a rare bird at this point. A week later, the speedometer started to fluctuate and started to die until no speedometer, no cruise, no odometer. I replaced the speed sensor to no avail, did this another two times, and no speedometer. Also repinned the harness, repaired wires at the ECU, nothing, took the gauge cluster out, resoldered the pins, and a whole list of other things that didn't fix the speedometer. So, here is probably what your issue is. All right, so on this generation car, uh, we have the cluster, which has our tack and all, you know, speedometer and everything. Then we have a wired connection to what is like a little transformer. It transforms a, um, a rotational signal into an electrical signal. Then there's the little stick that goes down into the transmission itself. These are all definitely technical terms, the little stick that goes into the, uh, into the transmission. Inside that little, that little tube, that little housing, is a small shaft, and then at the end of it is a gear. That gear attaches to a gear, it doesn't really attach. It connects to a gear on the differential. That gear on the differential is what turns and turns the gear, which turns the little thing inside the sensor, then that sends the signal to the cluster to read your speed. Uh, it's not a direct connection, like a cable mechanical connection from the transmission to the cluster. So you said you replaced the sensor and, and some other parts. I'm not exactly sure what of that unit you have replaced, but there's one piece that you probably didn't because we'd be talking about how much you hated life pulling that transmission out and that's the little nylon gear on the differential. What happens is that little nylon gear will actually crack, and then eventually it just comes apart and you find it laying in the bottom of the transmission. So that's why sometimes you'll get like a wonky signal or nothing until like 30 miles per hour, then you'll start to see the signal pick up or the speedometer uh, I'll just jump around all crazy through like the whole speed range. So what's the fix? Well, the fix is to take the transmission out, separate the cases, take the differential out, pull one of the bearings off, pre uh, pull, well, the nylon gear may not be there, take the nylon gear off, throw it in the trash, put a new gear on it, press a new bearing in it, and put it all back together and install it in the car. If this is a manual transmission, the automatics, uh, at least in the Mark IV generation, which I've done plenty of, are quite a bit easier. You don't have to separate the case. You can just pull the cover off take the uh, axle flanges out and pull that differential out. It's really, really easy to do it on one of those. This is why I was really happy when I got that limited slip differential that it came with a metal gear for the speedometer and not the nylon one. Now, I would have been okay if it had a nylon gear, but I would have made sure that I installed a new one. So what you can do is you can take that sensor unit off of the, out of the transmission. So you're gonna take the whole thing off. It's a stick, oh, I don't know, eight inches or so long. You're gonna take your flashlight and you're gonna look down in that transmission. Uh, you're gonna look through that hole in the transmission and you're probably gonna see the gear not there. You should see directly down, you should see that gear on the differential. If you don't and you only see a bearing, like the backside of a bearing, a roller bearing, or the differential on the other side and there's a gap about, you know, a quarter of an inch, half an inch, give or take, your gear's gone and it's probably laying in the transmission somewhere. If that's the case, I already told you, you're pulling the trans out, taking it all apart, or 
uh, you know, it sucks for the trip because you're not going to be able to calculate trip or miles on the car, <laughs> but you can just use your GPS on your phone if you're only worried about knowing how far you're going or, uh, or how fast you're going, you're not going to have that mileage counter in the cluster. So then that, you know, potentially could create title issues. You have a vehicle now, true miles unknown, which can severely devalue the value of your car. Although on a Mark III, you're not talking about a whole bunch of money now anyway. So take that stick out, look down into the transmission. You'll probably find that your gear is either broken or completely, completely missing. All right, next up is from Trapper. Afternoon, I have a question about reliability and ease of repair. I'm looking at an 05 Audi A8 4.2 liter V8, but have no prior experience with them. Any input or options are greatly appreciated. Dude, run, run away, don't buy it. Um, I'm mostly kidding, but kind of not really. One of the cool things is that generation now of Audi A8, Volkswagen Touareg, um, Volkswagen Phaeton are super cheap. You can get them for like three grand in a condition, right? Not great condition. Great condition ones are six grand. And that's still a hell of a hell of a lot of car for um, for six grand, especially considering those were seventy, eighty, ninety thousand dollar vehicles when they first came out. All right, I am going to say, do not buy this car if you do not have experience with this kind of vehicle if you do not have the tools to work on this kind of vehicle, and you don't have at least whatever you spend on the car set aside to make repairs. These cars are challenging to work on if you're not used to working on German cars. For me, it's not a big deal, because right, I cut my teeth fixing the Volkswagen Tourags and Volkswagen Phaetons, which are essentially, they're not exactly, but they're very much the same vehicle as the Audi A8. So it's not a huge big deal for me, yet, the thing people don't consider when they're buying a used luxury car, which is what I would consider the A8, sure, you're spending, call it 10 grand on one that's, you know, almost perfect. You're buying a $10,000 car. In our brains, we think, oh, my car's only a $10,000 car. What we forget is that we're maintaining and repairing a $90,000 car. So even though we've only spent 10 grand to get it in our happy little paws, uh, we're still buying parts for a $90,000 car, paying labor for a $90,000 car, having tools required to fix a $90,000 car. That alone makes me say to most people looking at buying these cars, don't do it. Now, if you were, dude, I'm a technician, I work on Mercedes all the time, and I'm very familiar with European cars, I would tell you, you know what, you probably get a hell of a car for a very low price, but since you're not familiar with these cars, and I'm gonna guess then you don't have the tools to work on it, I would probably say don't buy this. And it stinks because those were really nice cars. And you can get one and it maybe doesn't have any problematic issues, but all it takes is one or two repairs for you to be way over your head in dealing with this vehicle. Not to mention the fact that this car is now knocking on the door, of basically a 15 year old car. So we have to worry, how well was it maintained? We don't know the answer to that question. Was it loved or was it not loved? And I've seen some Phaetons and Toregs, boy, that were not loved at all. And you, you, there's a lot of times no coming back from that in a reasonable way. I am a firm believer that there's no more expensive car to own than a cheap used luxury vehicle. So your car's 15 years old, that means that Audi, Volkswagen, whoever you're buying doesn't have to support that vehicle. It's something I'm dealing with my 05 Passat right now because I need some parts and they're not available anymore. So what happens is aftermarket comes out with a solution, maybe it fixes it, maybe it doesn't, or they don't at all because the A8, it's not like an A4 where there's you know a ton of them running around. That's a pretty low production number car. Also, something we ran into with the Phaetons is they all had air ride, and in the US they all had air ride, and uh, let's say you had an airbag go out. Well, it was you know, 2011, 2012, and they no longer made that airbag for the cor whatever corner you were having a problem with. So what did you have to do? You had to buy four airbags, and maybe even a module to, uh, to reset the suspension to make it work properly. So all those things considered all those things added up. Dude, I would not buy that car. I really wouldn't, unless it's a project car or something you want to buy to learn on. 
something like that. If you're buying this car to get you tuned from work, you're buying this car to put your family in, anything remotely close to that, don't do it. Your money is going to be better spent on another vehicle that maybe isn't as fancy, but is going to be a million times more reliable, way cheaper to work on, way less of a headache, all those things added up. I don't love buying the used, old, 15-year-old luxury car unless you are the type of person that either knows the car or you're buying it as a learning curve project kind of thing. Otherwise, dude, don't buy it. Run away. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, let's put it this way. Even I don't have a 15-year-old Audi A8 or a Phaeton at this point just because the parts are so expensive. Even though I can do all the labor myself, even though I can get a discount on parts, the parts are still crazy expensive. And so to me, uh, it's a lot of times just not worth it. But if you're insistent on it and you do it, please take it to Audi, get a pre-purchase inspection. Even if you know cars well, take it there, let them scan it, let them do the full run of the cars. Ask for the dude that's been there long enough to have worked on those when they were under warranty. Uh, that way you don't get the your guy that's been in a year and has never even seen one of those of that vintage. Not that there's any problem with that. You just want someone that knows that specific car really, really well. And 15 year old, that car at the dealership is old, 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 old. A lot of guys may not be super familiar with it. All right, last one of the day. I'm only taking three today because this one is kind of long, but it's a great question and something I think that uh, is an important one to talk about. And I get this question or a version of it all the time. My wife and I found ourselves in a situation about a month ago where her 90 year old grandfather who owns an old school service station is wanting to sell it. I brought up that even though I've never had any formal training, I've worked on cars for the last 14 years as a hobby, that's gonna be a key as a hobby and might be interested from buying it. The following day he informed us that if we moved down where he is, he would just give us the business because he doesn't wanna see it sold off and leveled. That's awesome. We looked through the books and even though it shows he's not making much money, he and his wife ensured us that with the cash sales, we would have no problem sustaining our lifestyle. While this makes my wife happy, I'm still left with doubt. He only has one mechanic that's on his last leg and will be retiring this year. I should mention that he's been in business for 60 years, so he has a loyal customer base is well known in the community. They've told us that they take care of the books and all the hard stuff at first until we learned to do it all. We're absolutely confident we can go down there and rock it. We've already put in an offer on a house and put up ours for sale, so we're definitely doing this. My question is, if an opportunity such as this were to present itself to you or anyone you know, would you jump on it? Is there any advice you can give someone like me for taking on an already established business? We'll be taking our two sons with us. There's absolutely no room for failure. Save that no room for failure too for a second. I'm willing to share any and all information I have. Everyone's super supportive, but I feel like now it's all on me and it's got me a little on edge. Dude, I know that feeling really, really well. I make great money now doing what I'm doing, but I'm far from happy and can't see myself being a dye technician for another 40 years. I don't know what I don't know, but I know that I need help. All right, Ethan, it sounds like, dude, you are primed for making this happen. A couple of things right off the bat. And don't take this as I'm telling you not to do it. Dude, I'm the biggest cheerleader of these kind of things. But there's a couple of key points that I really want you to understand. First of all, it sounds like you're a technician of some kind, which is good. That means you understand the mechanical world. And so what I'm about to say isn't taking anything away from your experience. You have never worked in a shop. Being a car enthusiast, being a hobbyist, all of that is very different, extremely different from being a professional technician, a professional mechanic, and charging someone money in a professional environment to fix their vehicle. It is a totally different world. While nuts and bolts are still the same, the mindset, the mentality of, hey, I'm gonna do my brakes this weekend, versus a customer coming in and, you pay and paying you to do their brakes is very, very different. Also, you said there's no room for failure. Um, you will have failures. You will have micro failures. The, it's like losing the battle, winning the war. Think of it that way. There will be micro failures. There isn't one person ever in the world's history that has started a business and not had some type of failures. You're pretty lucky though that you got this dude that's owned this shop for 60 years to help you through the transition, but understand that most people at 90 are extremely stubborn and stuck in their ways, and he's gonna tell you how to do it because that's how he did it, not maybe knowing you know, that the world is very different now than it was five years ago even. So keep that in mind too. If someone offered this to me, I would probably jump on it instantly. 
because wow, what an amazing opportunity to basically be handed a business. The other thing that concerns me a little bit is that the books don't look good, but there's cash sales. Uh, I don't know really like the two sets of book thing makes me a little uneasy. I wouldn't rely on those cash sales at all. I would rely and judge the success of the business based on what the books say because we don't want to get ourselves into trouble, right? So I would take that as, as kind of what the books say. Now, you got a guy that's on his way out the door as a technician. You got the guy that's on his way out the door as an owner. First thing I would do is I would find a technician to work in your shop, someone that's worked on cars, a lot. You know what I would probably do? I'd probably hire two. And yes, it's going to cost you a lot of money. And yes, you can do some of this stuff. But again, you're not a professional technician and there's experience around that that you have got to have. I would do that day one because that old dude that's been there forever fixing cars is on his way out the door. You can pull him off the line, have him as a mentor, have him as a trainer, have him teach these younger technicians how to do business right. These guys haven't been in business for 60 years doing business wrong. They've been in business doing this for this long because they're doing it right. So we want to teach these young technicians the mentality of what it's like to work on cars for a living, not just we're fixing a broken vehicle, but we're part of this customer's family because that vehicle is so important to, to this, the family that owns it, right? That's coming into you for service. Dude, I think this is a cool opportunity. Again, hire a technician because you are not a professional one. That's okay. You don't have to be right away. You can be you know, the floater. You said your wife's going to do the books. Awesome. Let her do that. You can be the advisor. You can be the guy to jump in and help out fix cars uh, when needed. Marketing. There's so much opportunity out there for a shop to do an amazing job marketing. Most shops do a terrible job uh, with all of their marketing. That's why if someone offered that to me, I'd probably jump on it in a second because I already have the marketing machine going, right? Um, I think this is really cool. I get asked all the time, hey, I'm a technician, should I start my own shop? Hey, I'm a technician, should I start my own shop? Hey, I'm in tech school, I wanna own my shop one day. I always tell those guys that ask me that, you need experience fixing cars professionally under your belt before you jump in and try and own a shop. And I'm gonna stand behind that statement. For you, I think it's a little different because you have someone there to help transition you into the shop ownership, but dude, you're gonna wanna get technicians in there immediately. Basically, once you figure out where the bathroom is, um, I would start looking for a young technician that has some experience under their belt, that has the right brain. Teaching someone how to fix cars is not terribly challenging. Teaching someone to be a good human when they're not is pretty much impossible. So look for the human. We can train the technician. You got someone with a million years experience um, working there in the shop. So that's a huge resource, but you don't want to continue to put all of the work on that dude and make it worse for him if he's old and on his way out. Pull him away, let him ease out of the business and bring up the next generation of technician. I'd probably involve him on hiring someone too, maybe depending on who that is. Sometimes sometimes us old dudes uh, get pretty grumpy and stubborn and don't like the new kid on the block. But um, this is cool, man. I'm excited for you. Please send me the information of the shop. I don't need the books or anything. I just want to kind of follow your progress. You have an amazing marketing opportunity. You have an amazing shop, amazing to be a part of the community, something a lot of us technicians really, really want for ourselves. The other thing I would look at is help. Uh, there's tons of like 20 groups and collaborative efforts to help shop owners like Ratchet and Wrench is one of the magazines that I get in the mail. It's sitting over there somewhere. Um, look through there and find some like peer groups or some mentor groups to really help you understand because I'm gonna guess that this shop that's been around for a while probably doesn't charge enough in labor uh, and probably could use some tuning up to really make it profitable. And that's not screwing your customers, that's not taking advantage of people, that's making the shop profitable because, contrary to what a lot of people wanna think, if your business is not profitable, it's gonna close down at some point. So having a profitable business means in a lot of ways having a successful business. Find that peer group to help you out through with some of those like more technical type stuff how to run books, uh, how to use shop management software, how to you know determine labor rates, whether to buy an alignment rack, whether not to, whether to hire another tech, whether not to. Those type of things are super valuable 
and uh, I would highly, highly, highly recommend it. So dude, keep us posted. This is awesome. I'm excited for you. I'm like jazzed up excited for you. So uh, best of luck, good luck. And uh, again, let me know where that shop is because I want the details of what you guys are doing so I can follow along. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap it up there. Questions, comments, go down below. If you like the video, hit that thumbs up button. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for watching or thank you so much for listening. And I will talk to you again next time.